need to laugh at the old uniform, but I didn't actually mind it. As you can see in the photo on the right, I'm the only person actually wearing it. So I do have to say I inherited my blazer from a family friend who was about six foot five already, and I never grew into it. I was always catching the sleeves on door handles. Uh, I think I've read too many boarding school novels and I thought the whole thing was terribly romantic. Midnight feasts and uniforms. So as you can see, there's that continuing theme of wanting to climb into books and live in them. And I'm pleased to report that in a certain light, I have succeeded. Something I did want to say really quickly is that I'm going to be fairly upbeat in this talk. Lives, when you turn and look back at a few decades, there's often a very clear narrative that makes a lot of sense. It was really messy living through it. It wasn't always fun. So I just wanted to acknowledge that um, if, if you're having a bad time with life, first of all, always see if you can find someone who'll be able to help you. Secondly, if you keep going, it usually gets better and makes more sense in retrospect. This is a really quick glimpse of some late 90s formal dresses. Actually, it could have been worse. I have seen worse. <laughs> and this is the boarding school common room. Uh, we were across the road there in the old, old girls boarding school. It was uh, expellable, expulsion offence to sing across to the boys' dorms, but we did have to send an emissary over on the first day of year 12 because they decided to introduce ties for all the year 12 girls and no one knew how to tie them. So we had to send someone over to visit her cousin and get lessons because YouTube didn't exist yet. The main reason I wanted to show this photo though is I was going through my photo albums and I noticed the bottom left corner is a great big pile of everyone's cameras, mm -hmm. film cameras. I don't think I got my first phone that could take, well, didn't get my first mobile phone at all until about five, six years after I left Concordia and I didn't get my first smartphone until um, 10 years ago after the Queensland floods. So, that's just to explain the quality of the photos. <laughs> so this is really small, with a little bit more context on 1996 and 1997. I do remember being quite excited to get to use the internet in the library. I only used it at a girls in maths and science summer camp before then. It's the year Harry Potter came out, the gun buyback happened, the year's Titanic came out, Midsummer Murders started, Princess Diana died, mad cow disease, Tamagotchi, John Howard. The postcard bandit escaped, Dolly the Sheep got cloned. And I had a great time at Concordia. <laughs> In retrospect, I had my bad times when I was here. I had my wisdom teeth out, for example. I was perpetually irritated at having to wear my hat on the walk to Clifford Gardens to go shopping. And I hyperventilated a lot before exams. I also had to go through being 16 and 17, which are not the best years of pretty much anyone's lives. It gets a lot better. <laughs> But all of those, those negatives have faded. Uh, not the panic before exams, I still do that. And something I have learned is that sometimes life isn't about gradually becoming a better person. It's about learning to do better with the person you are. And I think by the time you're in 11 and 12, you've already got a bit of an idea of what sort of person you are. But there's so many years ahead of you to work out what you can do with that. And that can be a lot of fun. I'm working on a PhD now, as you heard in my introduction, and I have learned to leave room in my schedule just for panicking. <laughs> but mostly what I remember is friends and music and winter and the girl from out, well, I was from out west as well, one of the girls from out west who came running in one winter going, the tree in front of the boarding house is dying because she'd never seen a deciduous tree. And boarding school misdemeanors, accidentally climbing a dry waterfall up the side of Picnic Point when we got lost on the school walk setting the alarms off on an ancient history excursion to the University of Queensland and running screaming out of Morgan Smith building and arguing that if a person represented the school at a national level in literature, they should get the same recognition of full blue as a person who did that in sport, which was probably obnoxious of me, but the arts have to take their wins where they can get them. <laughs> a lot of things happened at Concordia that have stuck with me some of which are probably not appropriate for public assembly. <laughs> but there are two stories that I did want to share with you. I don't have any pictures of the choir, mostly because there were just fewer photos in general. And it is a shame because the cummerbund and yellow scarf combination was memorable. This photo is actually from a school production of Pirates of Penzance. We all did our hair up in rag curls really tight and slept in it overnight and then had to wear it to our hair like that to go to Glenny for another ancient history event and then 
just everyone had corkscrew curls, it was kind of disturbing. But my most vivid memory of choir is from the day of choir sign-ups, when we were told severely that we did not have to be able to sing well to join the choir. But if we joined the choir, we would sing well. And it's a saying that I've actually found very encouraging. It's applied in life to a lot more than just choir. It's what I've actually looked for in good bosses, someone who doesn't expect me to be good at something in order to do it, but who expects me to work to a high standard and learn how to be good at it once I start. And it's also a lesson that I try to bring to my many, many, many new pursuits that I've picked up along the way. The other memory is a sports situation. That's me in the front at sports day. I don't know if it's changed, but when I was here, Concordia was not known as the most sporty <laughs> school in Toowoomba, certainly not the most successful. And my sports house was not the most enthusiastically athletic. So when we had our house sports day, we were all forced to run the 100 meters. And the faster girls decided they simply could not be bothered. And they agreed among themselves to stop dead at the 99 meters mark. It didn't actually occur to them to warn the slower of us that this was happening. And by the time we worked out that everyone had stopped, our momentum carried us over the finish line and we won and we had to go to finals. <laughs> I developed a very strategic sprained ankle that day. <laughs> but I learned three lessons from this. Walking will get you most places in life just fine. <laughs> If you stick around long enough, the people who started with you will sometimes unexpectedly do very interesting things. And if you keep blundering inelegantly forward through life and get enough momentum up, you might find yourself somewhere startling, like up here. Then I graduated, it was graduation day, and went to uni where I studied German and English literature. My broad idea was to eventually become a writer and therefore I should probably get a job in the public service and therefore to make my arts degree look more impressive since I had the degrees, I should enrol in law. This actually backfired. My dad told me the door in is always narrower than the door out. So I took the first job I was offered and ended up becoming a lawyer for 10 years and also a German translator. It took me a few years to get back out of all that. Um, those of you who are interested in an arts career, money is actually a bit of a trap. You need money, you should charge well for what you do. It's good to have a good paying job to keep you going while you learn what you want to do in the arts, but make sure you have an escape plan in mind. Your responsibilities grow to fit your income. And it took me a long time to stop being a lawyer just because I got used to the pay. I worked in private practice and in the Department of Transport Main Roads, and I was actually good at it. Being objectively competent in something is quite a high. I recommend, I recommend getting into a job where you're actually quite good at it for one, one point in your life, it's very nice. But I didn't love it best. That's me running off to uni. And the whole time, all the way through, through uni, through seven years at uni, including my honours degrees, through being a lawyer, I did what I did at Concordia. I drew in the margins of my notes. And I wrote short stories. And I started a Doctor Who webcomic. I drew everywhere. I stopped learning the bagpipes to make more time for drawing and writing. Although like most life experiences, that little musical detour has proved useful in unexpected ways. Keep an eye out in the future slides. These are just some pages of sketchbooks. You can't see them in detail here, but the sketches from some of the places that art has taken me, Dartmoor, Iceland, different parts of America, England, Norway. And I became an illustrator. This is a little progression here from my very first book cover at the top left, uh, which actually isn't terribly well drawn, uh, through some significant ones from my career. Some of them aren't great, but they were books and art that put me in touch with people who are interesting and making interesting art in the world. I got better. I got into better books. I stopped being a lawyer, which was kind of terrifying, and I went back to uni to study an MPhil in Australian Gothic literature, mostly because a friend who was also a professor at the university told me to stop complaining about it taking so long to save up enough money to leave law and just quit and apply for a scholarship. I began to have a recognisable style and to be able to travel. 
as I mentioned, to many places. Usually in years that aren't 2020, 2021, I'll spend two months overseas in different countries for work. The beautiful thing about working in art and writing is that nearly everything is tax deductible. You just don't earn a whole lot of money to pay tax. <laughs> I go over for conferences and art residencies and publisher meetings and just to catch up with friends and sleep on sofas and spare beds. And gradually I found I was illustrating for authors like Cassandra Clare who wrote Shadowhunters, for Garth Nix and for Holly Black. For those of you who read Holly Black's work, this is the map for The Cruel Prince, her recent, first book in her recent trilogy. And behind all of this, I kept writing. I sold short stories here and there. I wrote an awful lot for my own entertainment things people never saw. And finally, last year, I have to say, I sold this before I turned 40, but it came out after I turned 40, so it's one of the many moments in my life where I'm like, I've lost my chance to be a child project prodigy. <laughs> my debut short Australian Gothic novel, Fly Away, which is set in something that's not quite, but very heavily based on Western Queensland, and particularly the Wando and Jackson area, was published in the USA and Australia, and my debut kind of poetry collection, it's not quite poetry, travelogues. They're very different books, and yet both are about looking at the world and learning to make wonderful things by finding the beauty that's watching, that, the beauty that's in front of you. Western Queensland in one case, and industrial developments beside international train lines in the other. And through all of this, my years at Concordia have helped me. We laughed then about not being the best at anything except for choir, but being able to find the joy, the fun, the worthiness in a cheerful stubbornness and to do things anyway, that's a skill that has taken a lot of people from my year a long way in life and around the globe. I'm friends now with people with whom I had a deep mutual suspicion or rivalry when I was in year 12. I've learned to like people a lot. I'm still quite shy, but being at Concordia was the first time I'd been in a crowd, really, growing up during school of the year. And it taught me just how interesting other people could be. And I have to say that when you get to your 10 year reunion, it's sort of confirmation, it's like, oh, that's who you were under the uniform. And then 20 year reunion is quite fun because it's like, oh, then you got interesting. <laughs> you did strange things in life, you got opinions. Not that they weren't interesting at the time, <laughs> but there's more to talk about. And finally, I learned too that if you are interested in something or everything and are willing to do something about it, to make something about it, to write something about it, and just to keep doing that, even if it doesn't seem for years and years that it's going anywhere, even if everyone thinks you should be doing what your best subjects were or what your degree was in, and if you keep doing it out loud for long enough and showing it to people, it can turn into something surprising and wonderful. Thank you all.